welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Notion TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And on today's show, we've got a bunch of headlines we're going to be looking at because a lot of news has come out since our last podcast. And then we're going to be talking about what we've been listening to and look at some things that are coming up soon and just kind of expand on those areas. So first of all, uh, since the last time we uh, talked, uh, Christopher Drake has had not only his score for The Dark Knight Returns, which was an animated feature, not only has that come out, but also he's previewed uh, the Arkham Origins score, which he also wrote. So we've got a link to our website, or a link at our website, that uh, gets you to some of the music you can listen to from his Arkham Origins score. I'll talk a little bit more about The Dark Knight Returns a little bit later on in the show, <clears throat> but it was pretty good. Then he's got an interview, we've also got the link to that, where he talks a little bit about the creative process. And then, um, so so he's a busy guy. So Christopher Drake has been really um, chugging away. Is kind of the, um, I don't want to say uh, Hans Zimmer of the video game world, but but basically he's been one of the the most uh, involved composers for the DC universe. Just not in feature films, like in animated movies and video games. So he's really been involved, and and some of his stuff. Uh, is is really cool, and then there are some similarities to like the Hans Zimmer sound world. But again, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, there was a cool thing uh, with Cliff Martinez where he was interviewed about his score to the film "Only God Forgives." Uh, Kevin, I didn't know. Did you have a chance to read that? Not really, and, and I, I haven't looked at it yet. And actually, I'm not okay. particularly familiar with this project either. It apparently looks like a new Ryan Gosling movie, but I don't know which um, about it. Well, no, that, that's that been out for a little while. It was more like now that the film has come out, um, here's a, oh, sort okay. of, um, uh, a play-by-play afterwards where Martinez talks about that they wanted, um, you know, sort of like some some authentic music. And because the film is of its setting and, oh, man, I want to say I want to say South Korea, that they used some sort of uh, like l- local styles, uh, some some dance styles based uh in that area and then they brought some of it into the score but it was uh it was kind of cool just <clears throat> if you're into cliff martinez and lately he's been scoring not just the ryan gosling films but the director is um nicholas winding refn and there's a very sort of stylistic approach martinez also did traffic so he's got overall like a really atmospheric sound and a really kind of ambient Pretty very textural sometimes. yeah 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 so if you're into that you're into cliff martinez definitely check it out um uh, let's see. I'll talk more about Gravity later on, but Stephen Price is interviewed, and he's got a nice little section where he does talk about his score to um, Alfonso Cuarón's Gravity, the movie with Sandra Bullock and, and George Clooney. Um, and then, Kevin, we saw a bunch of stuff about Hans Zimmer. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, actually, something we mentioned, I think, on the last two episodes, if I'm, if, if I'm right, um, Hans Zimmer talking about if he's going to score the the Man of Steel sequel, the Superman Batman movie, or Batman mm-hmm. versus Superman, I guess people are calling it. Um, yeah. it and we had sort of uh, talked about how it may not be an easy decision for him because he's already scored a Batman franchise, and this is a different Batman. Uh, well, we've got an article that has come out, an interview with him uh, on Slash Film, where he's basically said that that. He's not sure if he wants to do it. He he sort of left Batman behind. He's not sure how he would do it again. Um, it's just kind of interesting that that you know he sounds, you know he, he was he expressed expressed a lot of um, a lot of doubt about doing Man of Steel because he didn't want to do something. He didn't want to do a Superman movie because he admitted that he's you know not as good as John Williams or whatever. However, he said it, um, but then he did it anyway. This one. I, <laughs> This one almost makes it sound like he's even more reluctant to do this movie. Um, do you feel like he's just uh, like like setting this as a, like a red herring, where he uh, is is sort of misdirecting the population into thinking, or at least those I, don't know. The I think that, in- that's what it seems like. Yeah, no, I couldn't wants. possibly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, he could be like, "Oh, Superman, I don't know, nothing's for certain," and then bam, he's he like meets once with Zack Snyder, and then and then he's scoring Superman. So yeah, yeah, this this I almost get the impression from this interview that it's this is maybe a little bit stronger than that, 
But I from what he what you said here, it seems like he's maybe farther away from doing this than he was with with Man of Steel. I don't know. It, he can still turn around tomorrow and say, "Yeah, I'm going to score this movie." Well, let me um, ask you then who who would you who would you want to do it? Uh, who would you want to hear doing a Batman uh, movie that hasn't done a Batman movie yet? Um, yeah, you know, there's this guy, that guy, Chris Bacon. He was an assistant composer to James Newton Howard, and I haven't seen him do a, a really big, high profile film, but except the the one with Jake Gyllenhaal, the uh, oh. Uh, source code. He did that movie Source yeah. Code, and I love the score. I mean, it had a little bit of the James Newton Howard sound to it, but it it had it. This guy like used horns. He used strings. He like knew his orchestra, and but it had electronics in it, and it had uh, it, it was cool. I like he kind of had a sound world. It wasn't just completely generic, regular triads or uh, over reliance on minor chords or anything like that. Right. And I, I'd love to see him get a chance or James Newton Howard fully take a, a movie like that instead of split duties with Hans Zimmer. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know if yeah. Marvel That's would let him, but I think an Alan Silvestri Batman score would be kind of cool. I was, well, that's funny. I was just going to say, I wouldn't want to see Alan Silvestri do it. Okay. Well, then screw you. <laughs> Why? Um, <laughs> I, Why not? You know, Why not? I don't know. I kind of... Let, let, let me rephrase. Let me rephrase. I think a, an Alan Silvestri 1980s Batman score would be cool. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let me clarify. Agreed. Um, Alan <laughs> okay. Silvestri now kind of feels like he's he's um, he's sending like he's doing his job. Like he's hired to do a film, and he's Alan Silvestri, and he provides it with a, a score that's that's competent. But the the really fun like catchy themes that just seems to be gone, uh, and and that's part of the style because Avengers is just a really uh, bland theme that's just got some you know it's a nice orchestration but it doesn't no one is singing that tune but people still today if i play the back to the future theme you know people yeah. know it so he he really hit home with that one um i anyway. think you can make the argument for with his his captain america score that he did more of that but i think it was because it was kind of a period movie and he could get away with it it didn't have to have a you know 2013 modern score that's just all texture and, and atmosphere and that kind of thing. I think um, that I think the yeah, I think Captain America was a little bit better for that film than the Avengers score was for its film. Yeah. But it still felt do you remember that radio show guy who in New York who ran Captain America music and kept like praising it every thirty seconds? He's like, it's actually live musicians. And I do remember that we talked about that that um yeah it was like a well, yeah, it was part of a radio show. I remember we talked about that, yeah. however long ago and that I, was. Yeah, I thought that um, that the reaction, and in some ways, our reaction to Sylvester's Captain America score was like he was getting a bump because it was an older composer who knew how to write themes and knew how to score a film and, and yeah. have a good time musically. And that guy was giving it a bump almost because it wasn't like the younger composers or Hans Zimmer. And when yeah. I just look at Alan Silvestri's score, if I had to like compare that to, you know, like more of the heyday of the '80s and '90s, and even the yeah. '70s scoring, it I don't think it would hold up that well in right. that right. element. But when it's standing alone now, out of uh, like out of context or fish out of water, it does stand out uh, quite a bit. But anyway, Dave, I don't know. That's a good question. There's a lot of composers out there. Um, I, a lot I, of people have done it. That's why I ask. Like, there have been a boatload of Batman movies. It's true. I know, you have, I, uh, I know they wouldn't go back and say, Danny Elfman, we want you to come I back. I sure and hope not. New... Yeah. What's that? I sure hope not. What, Danny Elfman? Yeah. Not, not a fan of that score. <laughs> it's <Really>? like <laughs> I love the Danny Elfman Batman score. Well, Dave, we'll it's talk little, more it's about It's a little romantic and cloying for me. We'll talk more okay. about the Which Danny I know Elfman is why you like it, Daniel. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just... Yeah, you know, I almost... Yeah. Now that I think about it, now that I think about past composers who have done Batman scores, even though he scored really bad movies, I would be curious to hear another Elliot Goldenthal Batman score, because that guy's got some chops. He knows um, what no, he's doing. He totally does. Um, and if he got with... No, no, he'd be good. If he got with a director like... Uh, Zack Snyder, it would not be as silly and like um, bombastic uh, in a '60s way that the that the um, Joel Schumacher movies were. 
it would be bombastic. Really kind of comic way, yeah. Yeah, it would be bombastic, but like a little more serious, I think. Yeah. But like good serious, like Christopher Nolan, good serious. But that guy, yeah. man, he can write circles around most of the other Hollywood composers. Um, yeah, yeah, he's got he's got craft and talent, yeah. and he knows he he knows what he's doing. Yeah, he absolutely. Still, still does film scores on occasionally, not not maybe quite as often as he used to. Um, yeah, he got he kind of checked out. He's been doing more opera course. things recently. I think. What's that? He's been doing more opera and and uh, I think well mostly opera stuff recently. I know. I keep uh, I keep remember, remember forgetting to check like uh, Amazon because he did this opera called Grendel, which is the Beowulf story, yeah. but told from yeah. the villain's point of view, and apparently it was awesome, and I want to hear it. So yeah. I keep you know hoping Amazon would have a recording. But yeah. anyway, anyway, so speaking of Hans Zimmer not scoring a superhero movie, we'll switch to Hans Hans Zimmer scoring unexpectedly a superhero movie, Kevin. Yeah, so uh, kind of out of nowhere, we get news that Hans Zimmer is going to be scoring um, the sequel to Mark Webb's The Amazing Spider-Man, um, which it, which is interesting. I mean, you know, we spent a good amount of time talking about the James Horner score to the first one, um, but Hans Zimmer is doing this one, and he's also kind of announced that I guess sort of in the vein of Man of Steel, he's bringing in a lot of high-profile producers and performers and writers um, to to create what they're kind of calling a super group um, for the the um, Amazing Spider-Man sequel score, uh, so that'll that'll kind of be interesting. I guess for me the biggest the biggest thing was was What's the super just group? a surprise that James Horner is not um, mm-hmm. not going to be scoring the second movie. Which we like we talked about his score, and I think there were some issues, and maybe I don't know. It's, it's all speculation, but. Um, so he's so far he's got Pharrell Williams who worked with him on Man of Steel, uh, Johnny Marr, Michael Einzinger, Dave Stewart, um, not some names that, that I know, but people who actually you know know stuff would probably recognize those names. Um, That's who so, our show is for. I mean, people who know stuff. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, you know, we're here to make other people feel smart because we don't know what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> yeah. So he's he's just assembling a lot of people that he's worked with. Um, like I said, he worked with Pharrell Williams on, on Man of Steel um, and um, some other projects, I think. So a lot of these people actually have um, experience usually writing songs for other films, but here it's a big collaborative thing. So, Is it, is it be, best towards be one instrument group or not? Um, I'm not sure if it's gotten quite that far yet. I think it's more on the composing and producing um, side of things. Okay. Okay, cool. So, there you go. And then, there was, then Kevin actually pointed this out to me earlier in the week, um, this article that a reporter asked, is Hans Zimmer repeating himself? Which, if you listen to Hans Zimmer's music, you know, well, the answer is not only it's a yes. It's ridiculous, ridiculous question. Not only is if it you yes, spend, but... If you spend, you know, a decade and a half in a single key, then yeah, you're repeating yourself. Sorry. <laughs> and also just in styles and approaches and sort of musical instrumental choices... It's it's the question of it's not if it's just how often has he repeated himself. But then there's also the larger question of these film composers, they have to take, in some cases, this the same type of scene that it has the same emotional undercurrent. What okay? Here's a sad scene. So the very stipul- stereotypical way is so score it with either a minor chord or some sort of minor figuration or me- melodic material or something. So what they often have to do is just find new ways to convey the same thing by rearranging some of those musical ideas. And then every now and then someone comes along and does it and sort of relays an emotion, but does it in a completely different way. And those are the scores that stand out. But the other people are doing their job perfectly well, and the audience and the turnout and the box office usually justify that. So Hans Zimmer has had to do that just like all other film composers. But I found it funny that that I guess it's because he's so well-known now. And he's actually yeah. Mr. Blockbuster that he's being like sort of isolated or, or sort of called out on it. But they did uh, what was it? It was 12 Years no, a Slave. I mean, it was 12 Years a Slave. I mean, 12, yeah. It was the cue from that. And they were comparing it to um, what? Thin Red Line? A cue from the Thin Red Line. Yeah. Journey oh, to the Line. Inception. It was a famous cue from, from it was that. Inception. 
They were uh, comparing it to Inception. Well, there, no, that, that one's in there too, yeah. Because they yeah. essentially have not not exactly the same chord progression, but like the same four chords rearranged a little right. bit. Uh, so that's the premise of the article is that some cues from 12 Years a Slave sound a lot like cues from Thin Red Line and Inception. Yeah, but if, but in do. the larger picture, I mean, looking at those examples, I think you can find very specific things. But in the larger picture, it I, I feel like a lot of Hans Zimmer just all kind of runs together. There are exceptions. I mean, his score to the Simpsons movie or his score to, to Rango or to Madagascar – are incredibly different, but these big drama things all seem to have the same approach in the same key with the same chords. Right. Um, it's just it, you know, and, and so, um, an, an aspect that is brought up in this article that I think is one we've talked about before that I think is a question worth asking. And, and you know, we this podcast is a great example. We've been talking about Hans Zimmer for like fifteen minutes now. Um, He's he's the guy that's doing everything. You know, how yeah. much of this is that he is just committed to so many projects? When you're scoring as many films as he's scoring, how much time do you have to to worry about each one of them sounding different? I mean, I'm yeah. I'm not sure that you can. Yeah. I mean, maybe he's repeating himself because he doesn't have time to do much else. I was just going to say he's being spread thin like a little butter over too much toast. <laughs> or, which, is, which is a reference to the Tolkien, but then I realized that's the only thing he's not scoring is The Hobbit. <laughs> Pretty much. Really? Seriously, that's like the only $200 million movie that he's not doing music for. I mean, you know it's a business, so they always say, which people contributed to this last movie that made over $300 million? Oh, Hans Zimmer's in there, so we'll get him to do this movie. And it's like, well, he's one factor, but do you want him and his sound? Is that right for your movie? And then... Uh, he'll cha- he'll change his sound a little bit, but I think yeah. Hollywood producers would say that's a silly question. Yeah. Oh yeah, is it right for your movie? They don't care. They just want to know <laughs> is it the is it the two hundred million dollar movie guy? Let's get him. Yeah, right, right. Well, but in the DVD extras, Dave, they always talk but about Hans Zimmer was just it. right for this movie. He was just perfect. <laughs> well, you know, all so, the movies are the same, so yeah, right, <laughs> right. In our movie, Hans, certain, I mean, let's face lot, it. There's a certain pragmatism to that. It's that a lot different. Than here's this my 200 million dollar movie. I want it to be as big as these other ones. So let me do everything that the other ones do, including hiring the same composer. There's well, a like, certain, it's like, you know, uh, Hans Zimmer. Our superhero, our superhero movie is going to end with like the world getting blown up, but like New York will be first, and then Gotham City. So we need, uh, you know, it's totally different than the last comic book movie where Metropolis was destroyed at the end. I mean, totally different. <laughs> so we really need a composer that can zero in on those nuances, you know. Anyway, <laughs> well, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. But, um, you know, I, I, I share with my music technology students about this Seaboard. I totally want one, but I don't have the money to afford it. But it shows Hans Zimmer testing it, talking about the Seaboard is basically a, like a rubberized MIDI controller slash keyboard that you um, you can glissando and you can kind of wiggle and get vibrato on a chord, but otherwise play a piano or or other it's similar. Kind of like just a black keyboard, basically. Yeah, the it's a real sharp looking instrument, sort of- and I won't it because it looks really good. And but anyway, it shows him testing it, and he's basically saying, "I'm going to use this," and it shows him kind of playing some horn licks and stuff. I don't know if it's to a film in particular, but so he's you know he's on the front, and he gets. I'm sure they'll give him a, a seaboard for free to promote it, but he gets to do that. But he's he's getting used for everything, so he's living it up. I mean, I'll hey. promote it. <laughs> right, uh, the seaboard friend of the show. That's anyway, right. um, so it. yeah. Anyway, uh, now was he this concert, Kevin, with new piano yeah. works? Was he included yes. in that? And we should yeah. say what that was. Okay. Yeah. So, so this was about a month ago. This was a, a performance in LA. Um, it was uh, a concert called Piano Spheres, uh, or it was a, a concert series called Piano Spheres um, by uh, pianist Gloria Chang. And she did a concert of solo piano music written by film, film composers. So this was not film music. Uh, for piano. This was concert music written by film composers. And it actually sounds like a really interesting program. I hope they recorded it. I hope that we can hear it at some point. Uh, but the, the program was this. 
Um, five Pieces for Piano by Bruce Broughton, friend of the show. Friend of um, the show. <laughs> world premiere of Tension by, um, or, excuse me, of Surface Tension by Don Davis of Matrix fame. Yeah. Uh, three Aids Jurassic Jurassic Park, US three. premiere by Alexander Desplat. Uh, world premiere of Composition 430 by Michael Giacchino. Uh, family album, uh, homage to Alfred, Emil, and Lionel Newman, world premiere uh, by Randy Newman. Conversations, world premiere by John Williams. And then uh, uh, some Messian preludes that were the audience choice for the concert. Uh, it's in- interesting to hear concert music by all of those uh, film composers. And frankly, if I had to pick some film composers whose concert music I wanted to listen to, this is not a bad list. Um, well, it's, in- it's interesting because it's stripped down. They can't hide behind orchestration right, or big, right. big Hollywood swelling moments. They have to just really have something that's – you know, a real true expression, a good musical thought. And uh, that would be really cool to check that out. A really interesting yeah. selection. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So this, like I said, this, um, this was a concert that happened just a little under a month ago. Uh, hopefully there will be a recording, especially with this many premieres on it. Um, I would hope that yeah. there's a recording because there's nowhere else we can get to hear those. Did this get a, 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 um, a repeat performance anywhere? Like a, any kind of encore by Gloria Chang? Because I thought I heard, I thought I heard about it a second it's time. Possible, I don't know. Okay, it may, it's possible. Well, hopefully they not only recorded the concert, but they have plans. That's just too many big names on that to you know to let it go by without an opportunity to yeah. to to promote it and and sell it. If if nothing else, at least an MP3 album. You guys don't think this would sound terrible? What's that? Don't get, Maybe don't I'm get being wrong. snob, but it no, sounds no, no, no. like this has a lot of potential to be a lot of terrible don't, music. Don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah. This, <laughs> the potent, I mean, most of these people are not with the exception of, you know, Bruce Broughton writes a fair amount of concert music. Don Davis more recently has written a fair amount of concert music. Um, John Williams has written quite a bit of concert music. Some of it's not it's all bad. All great. You know, some of it's okay. Some of it's pretty not good. Um, but you know Alexander Desplat, Michael Giacchino, Randy Newman. I don't. I don't know of any concert music by those guys. Yeah. So I think this this had the potential. It could be really cool. It could have also. It has the potential to be fairly bad as well, which is kind right. of the reason that I sort of want to hear. Um, it's like the thing to do absolutely. would be to to just listen to Randy Newman's, and if it sounds like that song that they parodied on The Family Guy. Uh, where he sings like by the tree about yeah. everything that walks by in front of him. He just starts singing about it with you know yeah. blues and jazzy chords underneath. If that's all it is, well, like I'm, I'm 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 imagining the Randy Newman piece to sound like a Randy Newman song without Randy Newman singing. And if that's what it is, uh, if it's something different than that, cool. I mean, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah that, I think that would be my concern with that. Well, with yeah. Alexander Spot and Michael Giacchino. <laughs> and maybe Don Davis to a certain extent. Those are composers that I, I kind of worry what it's going to sound like when they don't have a highly polished orchestra. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I got to say, against. you know, I would be concerned with like, uh, they're the wild cards. I think Desplat has got enough education, but Giacchino, well, who knows? I mean, that's why, that's why you look. That's why I want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If it's going to be a train wreck, I want to hear it. If it's going to be really good, I want to hear it. Games aren't played yeah. on paper. They're played on concert recital stages. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, cool. so hopefully um, it, you got to find out more information. Uh, check out yeah. the link on our website. Um, hopefully, w- if there's more news about that in the future, we'll try to address it as well. Um, so, Kevin, I heard about this today, this, this song for the yes. desolation of – Smaug, right? Nice. Was, and I and I thought I heard the artist's name, but then I was, but then I didn't, and so I was very curious, who is behind the song? Uh, that's a good question. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Ed, Ed Sheeran is the guy's name. He is um, uh, a British musician. Uh, I guess I uh, a singer songwriter of his own, um, but I believe tours with some other pop musicians and things like that. Um, I, I've listened to it. You can actually hear the song. He's got a, a like a music video of the recording session, basically posted on YouTube. Um, and actually, I think I found it because Peter Jackson had posted it on Facebook and talked about the song a little bit. Um, is he playing a lot of the instruments besides singing? 
Yeah. He actually apparently okay. decided to like learn violin that day and play some fiddle stuff on the song too, even though he had never played violin before, um, which is interesting. Well, my big takeaway of it is I've listened to it a couple of times. Um, and of course we have the end credits, um, Misty Mountain song from the first movie. Yeah. I, I think I can kind of summarize my my feelings of these two songs this way. Um, <laughs> okay. in that the songs for the songs for the Lord of the Rings trilogy were artists that were chosen by the producers. They were chosen by Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh and Philippa Boyens. Right? The songs for the Hobbit movies. I feel like those artists were chosen by Peter Jackson's kids. And he, and he even says so. He said that um, uh, Ed Sheeran, the guy who wrote and recorded the song, was brought to his attention by his daughter, which is fine. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that this song and the song from the first Hobbit movie have more of a younger pop flavor to them than the more folk music flavor that the Lord of the Rings songs had. That's just... Yeah. That was kind of my first reaction. Well, I think Howard Shore had something to do with uh, Annie Lennox, right? In the in the Return of so. the King. Yeah, and they, I think they asked him who he wanted to work with, and that was like his first choice. I think the good and the bad of it is that we'll get another song, I'm sure, with um, whatever they title the third Hobbit movie, but probably yeah, no chance that, that we'll get the, Annie The third Lennox. Hobbit movie, I think, is um, There and Back Again. It's like the other subtitle of the Hobbit yeah. or whatever, whatever the case is, so... Yeah, we definitely have one more song coming with the last movie, but it just stylistically the songs for The Hobbit seem to be markedly different than the songs for the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, but like I said, they seem, and that that has been kind of I think the overall reaction of things that I've been reading as well. These songs just seem to be more poppy and less folky, and therefore because they're less folky, potentially less appropriate for the Middle Earth universe world if you will yeah, yeah. i you anyway. know it could be it could just be a concession to his kids or it could be a really pathetic thing where the producers are like hey um we know we got the older crowd because they saw all of our movies 10 years ago but let's at least make this one concession to younger audiences by putting in a song but i don't i don't know if i buy that i, I, don't, I don't think it's that I, i've never I heard of any of these Jackson people they're getting warner brothers so much money yeah. that he's he's doing what he wants to do yeah, yeah. Which which is great. I mean, you kind of it's wish more directors. It's great not that. great, I guess. It's great until it, it's great until your name is George Lucas, right? Uh, something like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, so we've got. Um, you can listen to Brian Tyler's score to Thor: The Dark World. Is this the entire score, Bill? You were the one that found this one. I'm assuming it. Yeah, it was. It, uh, from what I could tell, I didn't have a chance to check out all the cues, but it had multiple, multiple cues. So it looked like it was the whole soundtrack, okay. basically. Upload to YouTube. I did check out the first one. It kind of has a little bit of that progression that was overused for a couple years there by everybody in remote control. The, is it the, the remote control progression? The um, yeah, where it's I, like I, minor I that from um, um, Chronicles of Narnia movie. Yeah, that's that's where I first kind of got yeah, bludgeoned yeah. with it. Yeah, it's in there. And then, of course, Brian Tyler's used it a bunch. And he's, you know, to the best of my knowledge, he doesn't have anything to do with remote control. He's made his own career all on his own, which is cool. Okay. Um, and like I said, you know, I if, if I had to be shameless and drop a name, I've, I have met him before. He's a cool guy. He's really cool. And he does conduct his own music. And he's familiar with classical composers and orchestration and, and conducting and all that. So he's got a very hands-on approach to the music. I still feel like I want to hear him really kind of unleash some cool music and it does seem to be very much like neutral you know his harmonic language is very you know functional i mean not i don't mean functional in the theory sense i mean it functions well in the movie but it tends to be just diatonic so you're not getting any surprises generally not a whole lot uh, of variety yeah no no it's i it's unfortunate the, those days are just slipping away where the composers really had a lot of harmonic color at their disposal and they knew how to use it um, yeah. Williams is very good at that, and so is Goldsmith. But but uh, but these guys, you know, G. Kino also not as much. Anyway, but Brian Tyler, he's got he, it's appropriately you know muscular. The horns are there. Um, the you know it sort of has a big beefy kind of you know big sound sound that you would think Thor should have. 
that was there, and I didn't get a chance to listen to the rest of it. But I hope to uh, go see the movie. So by the time we ha- we meet again for the next uh, show, that I'll be able to talk a little bit about Thor: Dark World. Um, yeah. So this uh, so now Tim Burton's got a concert. It's like a collaborative thing with Danny Elfman that's been playing in yeah. uh, big city it's London, in- L.A. Right, New York. London, L.A. It actually, um, you know, I was being from Michigan. I saw um, a bunch of friends of mine went to. Um, the Detroit Symphony did a similar thing. Yeah, um, I, I think it was like I think it was like the same concert series. It's basically called I think like the music of Tim Burton or something like that. Yeah, where it's Danny Elfman's music to to his, his music to Tim Burton movies in concert form with an orchestra. Um, I know in the, I think in the L.A. concerts he actually sang. I think he sang some songs from Nightmare Before Christmas. For which, I mean, he sang the songs in the movie. Right. Um, so he actually sang in the concert. I don't know that he has been doing that in these other cities. Um, but the but the reviews and, and general reactions to this concert series have actually been really good. It sounds like it was, it was pretty cool. Um, you know, he kind and of... And I'm a little surprised that something like this hasn't happened earlier, actually. Uh, right, right. No, I, I agree. And he really is kind of like a John Williams for the next generation of, uh, you know music lovers, film lovers and all because of everything he did was um just just was the sound of childhood for a lot of people. Simpsons and Tales from the Crypt and uh uh crap, let's see what else. Uh Pee Wee's Big Adventure, Batman, Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands. You know, all of that. Um I mean, he was he was there. Dick Tracy for the diehard fans, I guess. Uh Black Beauty, Summersby. I mean, I love a lot of those scores as well. And that was sort of like my t- teenage to late teenage years. I I was kind of into Elfman, but it just kind of it didn't quite strike the same chord that uh, Goldsmith and Williams and some of those guys did. But but he's the you know he, I like his scores too, and and sure. he's he's definitely a major player. So this is a cool yeah cool concept and great concert and and everything else. Um, you found out some information about the Star Wars TV series. Yeah, so there, there's um, I think it's a new animated series, right? Star Wars Rebels. Okay. Um, it's this, this was a, a question that, well, or, or some rumors that were brought up. This is on uh, Star Wars Seven News dot com. Um, it, so some rumors about who is going to compose the theme song for this new TV show, because apparently there are three rumors. Um, Michael Giacchino being one. Another one. The, another rumor is that actually J.J. Abrams himself would be um, <laughs> writing the theme song because it's not something he's completely unfamiliar with. He wrote the theme to Alias. Um, so yeah. he has some cool experience with doing that kind of thing. The other rumor was that part of the package of bringing John Williams back to do episode seven is that he was going to write the theme for this, um, this show, which to my knowledge, he hasn't written a TV theme song since, you know, the lost in space days, basically when he was doing a lot of TV music yeah. way back or in the NBC 60s. Nightly um, news. <laughs> that's true. I guess I, for, I, I forgot about but, all the NBC stuff. Well, but, but, yeah. but that's that's kind of a separate. That's a it's, apples it's a and oranges. Different. But yeah, yeah. Well, um, that's so be it, interesting. It can be interesting to to see how that yeah, sort of people are kind of jumping for any rumors regarding anything Star Wars, and this this seemed to yeah. be, I thought, an interesting musical one that popped up. What I had actually heard, I'm uh, on the Star Wars stuff. I'm really kind of I just I, I just don't even care because after the. The way Abrams and his whole crew dealt with the second Star Trek movie about basically they wouldn't answer questions directly and then they would lie only to keep the surprise in the movie. Well, that's fine if your movie has surprises, but don't lie about who main character is going to be because then – well, anyway. Uh, so yeah. there's been a lot it, of – so far – Frankly, like, it's all white noise at this point. So. Well, that's just it. There's like a lot of misdirection and a lot of lies or rumors or whatever. So I just don't even care. I don't give a damn. Just w- just open the Star Wars movie, complete it, and I'll go see it. But uh, yeah. they have come up with a list of basically technical people behind the scenes that are definitely hired. And so if there was ever any doubt of the rumor that, that it was like, no, Ben Burt will be there for sound and John Williams will be back for music. So all that's like official. And then, of course, uh, Lawrence Kasdan is now helping out right write the film, which is kind of good, but could be bad, but could also be very good since he helped with Empire and Return of the Jedi. So that's kind of exciting. Anyway, again, I don't care. I'll just wait till they they open it in theaters. Yep. Ugh. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, our, our last 
bit of news here. It's been announced that there will be a 42 track uh, album of music from Arrested Development that will be released, which I think is is really interesting. Here's why I'm interested in this, and this is something we talked about several months ago when the newest Arrested Development season came out on Netflix. That wow. Arrested Development has so many inside jokes, so many running gags, and the music of Arrested Development does that too. There are um, a, a lot of you know things that show up in one episode that show up in another episode, and they're often very funny. The music is is a very funny component to that show. So I'm curious how that experience changes when you're just listening to music by itself. Like, am I gonna am I going to recognize some of the jokes and some of the funny things that this music was doing um, without the rest of the show to be there with it. So I, I think it will be an interesting listen because of that. Well, if it's 42 tracks, I'm guessing some of them will be quite brief because they may only be the musical joke that they were on the show and then quickly move on to the next track or something. So anyway, any Good fans day. of Arrested Development, check it out and uh, we'll have the link at our website. So uh, yeah, pretty cool. Um, now I wanted to jump, I wanted to switch around and talk about the new releases and just sort of quickly explain those. And then I can talk more about some of the ones I've had a chance to listen to in the last little bit. Um, so I don't mean to make this just a straight up listing, but some of the more important things that have been out recently, uh, the Dark Knight Returns score, as I mentioned earlier by Christopher Drake is an MP MP3 only album. Uh, in fact, you could buy one or the other or the two together at a lower cost. Amazon, iTunes, uh, wherever you get your MP3s. Um, Black Beauty, which is uh, an expanded uh, sort of uh, limited edition expanded version is uh, by Danny Elfman, is also out now. Alien Nation, which was a film that Goldsmith scored the whole thing with electronics. Then they decided that wasn't the right tone, so then they hired someone else uh, named Kurt Sobel. Those are uh, both t- out together in a two-CD collection. Rising Sun... Uh, a Michael Crichton book that was adapted with Sean Connery and Wesley Snipes with a score by the awesome, amazing, and one of my favorite Japanese composers, Toru Takamitsu, is also available. Uh, Day of the Dead, a two-CD score by John Harrison, is also now out. The Miracle, a two-CD set by Elmer Bernstein, not to be confused with the hockey movie Miracle. That's different. Um, And uh, The White Dawn by Henry Mancini, sort of uh, one of John Williams' teachers and protégés is also out as well. So I didn't listen to all of those, but I thought many of those were noteworthy. But uh, some of that I did listen to, as I mentioned before, the the Drake uh, Dark Knight Returns, uh, I do like those DC animated films. They're, they're kind of, a, they're more than they're just a guilty pleasure. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're more than a guilty pleasure because I love the Justice League show and I, I, you know, Batman the Animated Series and the Superman show helped me get through college for crying out loud. But the, the, the thing is, is... Uh, the, uh, this uh, this one is a, a direct adaptation of the Frank Miller, and they did it in two parts. So um, they actually released a Blu-ray later with both parts combined, and it's like a three-hour film. And it's really faithful, and it's really like, you know, when the graphic novel was rough, the animated show was – the animated version is rough as well. But the score is awesome. It starts out total electronics to portray the middle of the 80s. If you remember the sounds of the 80s, like Miami Vice – Axel F, things like mm-hmm. that. Very, very synthesizer driven. So this music starts that way. And then throughout the story, as more things develop and more things hit the fan, um, the orchestra comes in gradually. And uh, I just, I love it. There's a, 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 a cool uh, sort of a, it's not really a, a, like a long theme, but it's sort of like a long motive that's used for uh, for the Batman character. And then just some some great sort of um, combination of uh, textures and um, just sort of like the electronic sound world. I love it. I do have a thing for that. I liked Daft Punk's Tron Legacy score, and I like going back to the 80s. I like the Never Ending Story score, and every now and then Tangerine Dream is okay. So um, anyway, if you like any of those things I just mentioned, or, or um, the M83 score to Oblivion from or March of this year, I think you you would definitely dig that. Uh, I did see a movie called um, A Dangerous Method, which is uh, Carl Jung and um, Sigmund Freud meet. And then they. That's, that's um, the, um, Michael Fassbender and 
the Gilmore, uh, the Joe yeah. Morganson, yeah, Morganson. Aragorn yeah. and Magneto in one movie. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> it, it wasn't until I had seen that movie that I realized how much those two actors look exactly alike. It's a little bit freaky. <laughs> Uh, I re- I had remember reading like very lukewarm reviews of the film, but the film does operate just on a really slow burn kind of way. But I really enjoyed it, and I thought that not only is the score kind of appropriately subtle and d- kind of dark in the way it needs to be, but they kept referring to Wagner, and then they quoted Wagner, or they showed a character play of Wagner, like a vinyl recording or whatever would have been around at the time. Uh, and then in the score, you heard like one of the ring motives from the ring cycle. And it was very nicely weaved in to the score along with the Siegfried idol, which is a, a, a fairly well-known piece of Wagner's anyway. So it was Howard Shore and it was, uh, it was very well done and very sort of tasteful and not anything like overscored or, or anything crazy. Um, let's see. I wanted to mention Bear McCrary, friend of the show. <laughs> I wanted right. to mention his, uh, his score to agents of shield. I have uh, been able to catch up with the show. Kevin, have you a little bit? I caught a little bit of, I think, the second episode. I have not been able to get into that one much yet. Okay. Okay. The tune is, is definitely there, and it's, it's catchy. It's you know, well-voiced in the horns, as you would kind of expect to be sort of heroic. It, I think it fits really well with that Alan Silvestri big orchestra sound from the Avengers, which makes a lot of sense. Right. And um, and he does some pretty good uh, like variations on it, and uh, and there are times that some of the cues just sound like it. It sounds like this is not a movie, but it's a TV show. But it operates sometimes like a like a little miniature movie because it's got um, you know like a lot of budget that goes into it. So sometimes the score sounds like a little miniature movie score, and it's kind of cool how it works that way. And Bear, I think I think he's doing a great job. It's it's just great to hear like strings, like live strings and instruments on a soundtrack for a tv show it's just really cool um yeah I, he's, I want, he's oh, working with a pretty nice budget i think yeah no no he's got he's he's got a great sandbox and a great bunch of uh, toys to play with in the sandbox so so great job there um i wanted to give a quick shout out to Stephen price's score to gravity um the movie is you you probably if you want to see if it's still out in theaters in your area check it out on the imax 3d it's the best way to check it out. And the score is like completely not afraid to be noticed and be heard and be really loud and really big. Um, kind of in a way you don't get with most other movies these days where they're trying to make everything realistic and the score kind of oozes in and then oozes out. This, this does not because when things go wrong in this movie, the music is right there uh, sort of capturing the, the horror or the drama or the, the, the thrilling elements of it. So um, and some of it, I was surprised that, uh, like every element that Stephen Price used was in some ways a very well-worn trope of scoring. And yet I, I didn't, in the end, I didn't hate him for it. It was like, well, that worked really well. And yet it's sort of a very familiar approach that a composer might take to this particular scene. And yet I was, you know, I was gripped when I saw the movie and I didn't hate myself later for still getting into the film the way I did. So it was, it was very well done. Good effort on all fronts for, for gravity. Um, and I just, two more quick things. I love the score to Rising Sun, Takamitsu. Uh, very, of course, very Japanese driven because of the story uh, and the, the movie in general. And then the Alien Nation, I really was curious to hear Goldsmith's, uh, his take on that. And um, I just want to say that this, this last year, there's been a bunch of Jerry Goldsmith reissues. And, not everyone's a home run. <laughs> so with Alien Nation... And, and more than one of them have been scores that were thrown out, right? Uh, yeah, this let's see. the first one this year. Um, no, I think like in the case of the Salamander or um, what was the other one? Salamander, Cassandra Crossing or something. A lot of these were scores that were just either re-recorded because the originals were hard to release or hard to find in the vaults and or not, or or destroyed. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, there was another one in in Sean uh, was pretty good uh, and just good. I mean, like good orchestration, good theme writing, good dramatic musical programmatic storytelling through the music. Um, it was just variety of good variety in in the development for the themes. But uh, Alienation was um, 
yeah, it was just it was very electronic, and I yeah, I just it wasn't really my cup of tea. But anyway, so right. so there it was. Um, so going forward, Kevin. So like I mentioned, Thor: Dark World. I definitely want to check that out. Yeah. Um, anything yeah. you're looking forward to seeing? Um, I, kind of the two big things for me coming up, uh, actually this weekend, the book Thief comes out, which, uh, oh, yeah. have a, a brand new John Williams score. Um, certainly not a type of movie that he's unfamiliar with. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of assuming I've only listened to tiny little bits of this. I'm kind of assuming it's going to sound a little like Schindler's List and a little bit like Angela's Ashes and his other kind of period drama things, which is okay. fine. I'm still excited to listen to it. Um, and we've got, uh, in the next month or so, the new um, Hobbit movie is coming out. That's going to be a big yep. one. Those are the kind of two off the top of my head that I'm looking forward to uh, in the very near future. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, same here. Uh, like I, like I was, I'll, I'll share the story that I heard. Uh, I'll share this with our listeners that I, I heard a, a film critic discussing when he saw um, – the book thief a couple weeks ago, he's watching the film and he said it was this intimate story about uh, this little girl and her father and they're hiding uh, a young Jewish man, I think in their home and they're trying to save him, protect him from the Nazis. And so she's stealing books. It's this very sort of intimate story. But he said, then all of a sudden the music would come out of nowhere and it was just this huge swelling, large orchestra score. And he said it really took him out of the movie and it seemed to not even fit. And he said, gosh, this just sounds like this big, epic, swelling John Williams score. And then he got to the end credits and it said music by John Williams. <laughs> so it's like, well, if it sounds like a duck and quacks like a duck, I guess that's what it is. But <laughs> it reminded me of, of, in some ways, Angela's Ashes, which is a very intimate story. And some of the score is intimate to match that. A lot of solo piano but um, it does have sort of the big swelling moments of the orchestra. And, of course, War Horse was, was some solo flute at the beginning, but then we're right into like a kind of quasi Vaughn Williams English string sound. So very, you know, kind of never missing an opportunity to, to, to be big, to be big. And, and it does. It feels weird in some cases because I don't know about you, Kevin, but I'm very much used to what is now the current trend. I mean, I'm almost used to that when I go see a new movie that um, – yeah. Like when, you know, like Spider-Man by James Horner, when it gets, when the score gets that much more presence, it starts to almost feel like a music video. And yet we sometimes bitch because we're not getting enough of that. So it's, it's kind of even weird the way it is from, from my perspective sometimes. But, but anyway, well, I'm looking forward to the book Thief as well. So, um, so, okay. So we'll check these things out and we'll be able to talk about them on our next show. Um, thanks again for listening. That'll do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches, you can listen to us on soundocean.tv slash SAP, where you can subscribe to our show, leave comments, and find links to the music we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.